but it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms. They did not know where I threw them. I led them the courts of human kindness, the bands of love. I was to them like those who lived in the My people are bent on turning away from me to the most high they call. But he does not save them of it. How can I give you up, Ephraim? I hand you over to Israel. How can I make you a cosmic? How can I speak like seven years? My heart recoils within me. I will not execute my fear of sanctions. I will not again destroy. For I am God, the Most Holy, the Holy One in your midst, and I will save you. The Lord. Thanks be to God. Join us in praying Psalm 63. O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh also longs after you. In a barren and dry land where there is no water. <coughs> I have looked upon you in your holy place that I might behold your power and glory. For your loving kindness is better than life itself. My lips shall praise you. As long as I live, I will magnify you and lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness when my mouth praises you with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the watches of the night. Because you have been my power, therefore under the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. Soul clings to you. Your right hand has upheld me. Those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the earth. Let them fall upon the edge of the sword, that they may be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All those who swear by him shall be commended. But the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. Now, before faith came, we were in the law until faith should be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be reckoned as righteous by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, we are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed you. There is no longer Jew or German. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, and heirs according to the promise. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, 
the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. You can have So the kids who are here, I really need a lot of help. It's all kind of hanging on you. Um, so kids, if you are listening, uh, <laughs> raise a hand if you are finished with school for the summer. Yeah, yeah. I, think it's, I was not anticipating whooping, but I think it's appropriate. Well done. Okay, and does your school have the rules that you have to follow while you're there? Yeah? <laughs> oh, I really appreciate the Ortega kids for like single-handedly carrying this part of the <laughs> Thank you. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just calling them out or you can tell them to a grown-up near you and they can call them out to me and Charlie or even John well, can participate as well. But what are some of the rules at school? Safety, yeah. Yeah, no running in the hallway, good. Don't go into the woods without permission. Don't go into the woods without permission. Don't go to an unusual school. <laughs> What's that? Listen to your teachers, yeah. Effort, effort. Effort, yeah, like effort, awesome. Any other rules you guys will throw in there? Hmm, don't be rude. I love that rule. <laughs> I love to follow that rule in my house, too. Um, Grown-ups who have been in school before, are there school rules that you remember following? Don't cheat. Don't cheat? Oh, that's a good one. No gun. Yes, I'm saying no gun. Yeah. <laughs> no spit wads. Ooh, dress codes. No spit wads. No game points. No game points. <laughs> no game points. <laughs> What's that? No phones. No phones. All right. So we know lots and lots of rules. The one I always remember from elementary school was standing in a single file line to go everywhere. Uh, but one more question for the kids. What is it like when you are done with school and you have been following these rules all day long, you've been putting forth effort and not being rude and listening to your teachers? What do you do when you come home? <laughs> What's that? Oh, feeling free. Oh, that's a great answer. Thank you. I promise I did not give them the script of the sermon, but yeah. <laughs> thank you. All right, you guys are off the hook. Thanks. Thank you. All right, well, I want us all to sort of hold on to those rules, to that description, and also to that feeling of when we finally shed them at home and feel free, because that's going to help us understand what this passage in Galatians is trying to say to us. It's part of this much bigger argument that Paul is making all through the book of Galatians that the Christians there do not need to convert to Judaism. They don't need to follow the Jewish law or rituals in order to follow Jesus. Now, Paul, who wrote the letter to the Galatians, is Jewish, and he was a follower of the law, so there's nothing in here where he's saying the law is bad. But he is going to make this distinction in this passage between life under the law and life in Christ. And he's going to say basically the best the law could ever do is give us a life that is nice and orderly and not rude 
like a very well-mannered school or prison. Something that's able to keep us in line and keep us out of trouble and keep us focused, but that's about it. But then on the other hand, life in Christ makes us these beloved children, these free people, people who get to inherit the full abundance of all <coughs> of God's promises. And in this passage, Paul is going to hold out this position as children of God against students sitting at their desk and say, wouldn't you rather have this? passage begins, now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be reckoned as righteous by faith. So we notice right away there's this before and after language. He says, before faith came, we were imprisoned under the law. And for how long? Until faith came. And it says this a couple of different ways. It says until faith would be revealed, until Christ came, until we would be reckoned righteous by faith. And we'll look at all of that after part in a few minutes, but we're going to start where Paul does, which is the before. What it was like before faith came, when we were imprisoned under the law. But I think to get there, it would be helpful to just pause for a minute and make sure we understand what Paul means when he says the law. The law is this really important part of the story of the Jewish people, Paul's people. It began thousands of years ago with Abraham, this very, very old man. He and his wife had no children. And God made them this promise that Abraham would be the father of this great nation of more people than the stars in the sky. And that through these people, all the people of the world someday would be blessed. And then it happened. Abraham's very, very old wife had children, and those children had children. And eventually there were so many of these children of children of children that they spread across this part of the Middle East. And there were a lot of them in Egypt, so much that they felt kind of threatening to the Pharaoh who was in power there. And so he made them slaves. Now this oppression, made God unhappy, the way slavery and oppression always makes God unhappy. So God called this man named Moses to lead his people out of Egypt into freedom. And the passage that Weber read just a minute ago describes this moment in Israel's history. Israel is the name of those people descended from Abraham. But this moment in their history was such tenderness, where he says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. We hear that language of sonship. And God actually used the same language when he went to Moses to tell him to go to Pharaoh to let his people free. He said, go tell Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my beloved son, my firstborn son. And in saying this, God is not being sexist and favoring sons over daughters. He's just communicating the status of his people within the cultural framework of a day. So he's actually raising this entire group of people, men and women, up to the status of firstborn sons. That's the status of heirs. That's who's going to inherit the father's everything. So it's this way of God saying, this People is my firstborn son. Everything that's mine is their inheritance. They are beloved. They have access to the abundance of the riches of heaven. So slavery is just incompatible with who they are. And then God did call his beloved son out of Egypt. And he parted the waters so they could walk through it like dry land and get to the other side. And when they got there, that's when he gave them the law, this code of ethics and behaviors that would basically say, this is how God's firstborn son behaves. This is what marks us as God's people. The law just sort of marked the boundaries for them. And so when Paul uses that phrase, the law, in the book of Galatians, he means all of this, not just a set of rules, but the whole story that gave way to it. And the law is good. 
The law kept people safe. It kept this wandering community in good order. It helped them try to focus their worship on the one true God who had given them everything. It protected them from their sins against one another. And they, it kind of tamped down the worst of human evil. It gave them this framework for trying to live peacefully and justly. But the law was never meant to be the whole fullness of what it meant to be God's son. The law was always pointing towards something more. And it was restraining evil, and it was confronting people with their need for God and the mercy of God all along the way. It was moving towards something. And that's what brings us to Galatians. We hear the limits of the law when Paul says that it imprisons us, that it guards us, that it's a disciplinarian. The word that gets translated disciplinarian sometimes in older translations is tutor or schoolmaster, but that's not really quite the feel of this word. It's actually the word that was used for a servant of the family who was kind of like, almost like a babysitter. They would mind the children on their way to and from school, sort of walk with them, make sure they don't get distracted, make sure they don't get into trouble, kind of keep an eye over them while they're doing their lessons. Just make sure they are not going to get into too much mischief. And so in that way, this disciplinarian, this law, functioned like the school rules that the kids were telling us about. It doesn't have the power to teach or transform anyone, but it's there to kind of keep a lid on the chaos. But God didn't create and call and rescue people just to keep a lid on the chaos. What he calls his people to is not just being well-behaved children at their desks. He doesn't call us to a life that feels like we are under the watch of a prison guard. All of that is this before part. Before faith came, before faith was revealed, before Christ came. And you can feel Paul is just ready to burst into the after here, to the good news. So this is what he says. Now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ, you are all children of God through faith. We are not students. We are not prisoners. In Christ, we are children of God through faith. Now, faith means a few different things in the book of Galatians. It means belief, which is what we normally think about when we think about faith. And Paul gives us things throughout Galatians that we put our faith in, that we believe that Jesus is God, that God raised him from the dead, and that through this resurrection, we are brought into God's family. That's all stuff we do by faith. But the word faith also means faithfulness, and that's actually the way Paul uses it a lot in this book. He's actually often talking about the faithfulness of Christ himself. How Jesus faithfully fulfilled all the law and the promises of God with his whole life and death and resurrection. How Jesus was so faithful. And Paul kind of puts our faith and Christ's faithfulness all mixed up together. He seems to have both of them in mind whenever he talks about faith. Because he switches back and forth, saying, when Christ came, when faith came, when Christ came, when faith came. And he gives us this beautiful description of how we get in on that faithfulness of Jesus. How that faith becomes our faith. He says this. For in Christ Jesus, you're all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Paul says that somehow by our faith and by our baptism, we get pulled into the life and faithfulness of Jesus himself. Christ's faithfulness becomes our faithfulness. We become one with Christ 
We are clothed with Christ. We belong to Christ. We are in Christ. We put our faith in Jesus' great faithfulness, and then in faith, we pass through the waters of baptism. And that is our deliverance from bondage and freedom and death into life. And we become so one with Christ in our baptism. Paul says we're baptized into Christ. That when we emerge from the waters of baptism, we are children of God. And so the words that get spoken over Jesus at his baptism, the words that echo God's deliverance of his people from Egypt, those become God's words to us too. You are my beloved son, and with you I'm well pleased. You've never really stopped to marvel at the miracle of your baptism. This is your invitation. And if you've never been baptized, or if you were baptized 40 years ago and you don't really know what happened, come talk to me. But there is still more here because we're not just given this oneness with Christ, we're also given this incredible oneness with every other Christian. We share this new status as God's children, and none of the old dividing lines matter anymore. Slave and free male and female, Jew and Greek. We belong to Christ. We are children of God. We are heirs. And that new status unleashes this radical new unity, this new way of belonging to each other as the freed and beloved people of God. And so it's really kind of a shame that for a lot of the past 400 years or so, a lot of times this passage has been looked at and sort of dissected and put on a timeline, trying to figure out exactly like how does conversion and salvation and faith and baptism work? What order do they go on? Who does what, when, how does it all fit together? So much theological energy has been spent trying to piece that together in this passage. But Paul doesn't explain it. This is as much as we get from him, because that's not what he's trying to do here. He's not trying to give us a doctrinal treatise. He's not trying to give us a systematic theology. What Paul is putting in this letter is a lot more like an emancipation proclamation. He is trying to throw the doors wide open on how big this thing is that has happened. Christ has come. Faith has come. Everything that belongs to the Father is ours by faith, by baptism, by our oneness with the faithful Jesus. It is this huge, liberating news. So in light of that, why do we keep living like fearful school kids? Why do we give the world the impression that the church is for people who know how to behave, who keep their hands on their desks, who stand in line? Why are our churches full of the kind of racial and class and gender divisions that Paul says ought to be obliterated by this liberating gospel? Why do we settle for a disciplinarian who minds us, who keeps us orderly and out of mischief, and what is really offered to us in Christ is this resurrection, a whole new way of living and being God's children. This passage is this decisive proclamation that school is out forever, that the prison doors are wide open, the captives are set free, and all of the old divisions of inside and outside are overturned. And so if we want to really enjoy the life that is ours in Christ, and if we want the world to see that the gospel we talk about is actually good and liberating and not just another set of school rules, then we have to live in this bold new reality now. We have to live as though it's true even we don't often see how true it is. 
Well, we're going to take our usual moment of silence, and then Katie is going to lead us in a song. And the melody for the song will be familiar. It's an old abolitionist hymn. It's a song of emancipation. But the lyrics have been reworked, and they are crying out for the kind of unity that Paul is talking about here in Galatians. And you might also feel like the lyrics are a little bit provocative. And I'm glad for that today. Because this passage in Galatians should be provocative. And Paul is often trying to be provocative. And the gospel really is provocative. So we're just going to let these words provoke us a little bit. We're going to receive them as their song, and then we'll join with Katie in the final choruses. We'll ask God together to make us one.
Christ being preached. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I invite you to be seated as we pray together. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you and praise you because of your faithfulness. Because of that faithfulness, you regard us as, we are regarded as God's children, heirs, and even given by your spirit and faith. Lord, we pray for the Universal Church um, for its members and its mission worldwide. We thank you for the ministry of our Archbishop Foley and our Bishop John. I pray that you would watch over and guide those who are in the process of selecting a new bishop. We pray for our own church leaders. We pray for Amy and look forward to her installation on June 29th, the day for celebration and giving thanks. By your grace, may she have a long and fruitful ministry for us. We thank you for David and for his ordination last, at the end of last month. We pray that you would give him and his family everything they need for the work that you call him to do. We also pray for Josie and Emily. We pray that in this season you would refresh them and give them rest. We also pray for Katie and Darren and the Hamlin family. We ask that you would lead them to a place and a ministry in which they will flourish. We pray for our own church and search for an associate minister. We ask that you would provide us a shepherd, an under shepherd after your own heart, who will feed us with knowledge and understanding. And we also pray for Liz and Simon. We pray for safety and travel, clarity and call to a people and a place for the next season. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. We pray for our nation and all in authority. Lord, we anticipate a Supreme Court ruling regarding our nation's laws about abortion. Give us, your church, gifts of grace, kindness, and hospitality so that we, your people, may welcome every person, unborn or born, sinner or saint. We give thanks for our holiday this weekend, Juneteenth, which commemorates emancipation uh, from enslavement. 
We pray that you would help us to see our nation's history, its glory, and its shame with clarity and humility. Among your people, this is a most fitting feast day because we, who have been set free by your Son, are no longer slaves to sin. We have heard and may proclaim freedom, peace, and the year of the Lord's favor. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the welfare of the world, including our country of the week, Myanmar, whose people, since a military coup last year, have been caught in an escalating civil war. We pray for your justice and care for the 135 ethnic people groups in that country. We lift up the Karen and the Kachin peoples, among whom the gospel has taken hold. And we also pray for the mostly Muslim or Hindu people who are being driven from their homes. We also pray for Ukraine. Have mercy, spare lives. Bring down to the dust those who call evil good and bring just peace. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our neighbors, particularly for Corpus Christi Anglican Church in Springfield, our sister church. May they be a community characterized by the uncommon transformation that comes from knowing an extraordinary Savior. We pray for their planned grill night this weekend, that you would be present and that they would be, uh, they would enjoy the fellowship um, and um, fellowship and welcome to their neighbors. We pray for the, our local community as well, especially in the time of continued stress by rising prices, especially on those who are most vulnerable economically. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, we pray for those who suffer and those in any trouble. We pray for your powerful presence and care for our sister Michelle, who's experiencing health concerns this morning. We pray for Catherine and Quatley and baby Victoria at this time of both rejoicing and sorrow at the passing of Catherine's son. We pray for those who are suffering from, continue to suffer from COVID among us. We also pray for expectant parents and the children who will joyfully soon join our fellowship. Lord, in your mercy. Let us now confess our sins to our Almighty and merciful God. Let's pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have not done. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with your spirit. And may you greet one another with the word of peace. 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 Peace.
I don't know. I, I like I know. that. I'm <laughs> trying to allow for some balance in you know? the body. I like that. I like that. <laughs> 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 Which worked out, it was okay because I had
heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. All things come from you, O Lord. And out of your own have we given you. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, for he is your living word from before time and for all ages. By him you created all things, and by him you make all things new. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of Holy, holy, holy Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, 
with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out into the world to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, the honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. And now we are going to pray for a couple of people who are leaving us, not permanently, but going on a long, epic quest adventure for about five months. So we would love to pray blessing and all the details to send out Jenny and Katie for us. So if you guys can come into the middle here. And if you are near them and just want to gather in and lay a hand on them, let's just all pray at once, blessing on these beloved sisters, and then I'll close this in just a minute. Thank you, Father, for Ginny and for Katie, for the many, many, many ways that they love and serve and bless this community with their abundant gifts. Thank you for all the ways they show us that you are like in the ways they lead and pray and worship and teach. And we pray that that ministry will go with them on the road and every stop along the way. We pray that as they travel, they would draw closer to you, to one another, to your people, to your kingdom and your work on earth. And between now and then, Father, we pray for every last detail of this move. Would you sort out every little thing, everything that needs doing, everything that they don't yet remember needs doing. Will you sort through their to-do lists and will you be their God of little things? you help them to trust and rest in you and now look forward to what is to come. We just pray your richest blessing on them. And now as we turn toward the cross, all our problems, we send to the cross of Christ. All our difficulties, we send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works, we send to the cross of Christ. And all our hopes, we set on the risen Christ. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Now let's go forth into the world, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.